I'm Barry Kibrick, and I want to thank all of you who have been tuning into our show via YouTube. As a staple on PBS, I'm so grateful that you can now see our full episodes online. I hope you're enjoying them, and please subscribe to our channel so I can continue to make them available to all. Thank you. Purpose, passion, and perseverance. Those are the first three words you see when you click on Nelson Davis's website, Making It. Nelson is committed to combining his passion in order to promote economic empowerment for all. During his career, he has spoken with over a thousand entrepreneurs from all walks of life. In our conversation, we'll glean those words of wisdom and see how they apply to business as well as personal growth. Nelson, my friend, it is always a pleasure to see you no matter when, where, or what time, but especially <laughs> on my show. Welcome to Between the Lines, my friend. It's a lovely occasion. Great to see you. Great to have a chance to sit down and talk about things that are meaningful to both of us. Well, I, I'm going to level with the, the viewers because we are talking about business. Nelson, you are the first person that got me a production job in L.A. as a producer. Were we and children then? Or? We were children. That's exactly right. I couldn't believe you were only 20 and I was 18. <laughs> and, uh, but a lot of it was interesting because at the time, I got already a sense about you and you had a sense about me. And what your story about that we're going to be discussing is all of the wisdom you collected from doing business. That's basically it. And from speaking, in your case, to thousands of different entrepreneurs and the wisdom that you absorbed. Well, I'm so fortunate, A, to be able to be here and have this conversation with you today. But as I look back over those years, and we met several decades ago, as a matter of fact, to gather up the insights and guidance and wisdom of those people. When you say entrepreneur, sometimes it sounds like a big fancy word and you think of a guy or a girl guiding the ship in a multi, multi-million dollar organization. But truly, entrepreneurship is a word that guides lives as well as business. And a person could be working away at their kitchen table right now with their dream idea or guiding a billion dollar business. They are all entrepreneurs if they think a certain way. And that's in fact, the message you really want to drive home is that it's not a matter of whether you're following these rules or points of wisdom to be an entrepreneur. It's that by thinking that way, you better your life no matter what you're doing. Absolutely. I mean, I've talked to a couple of people who talked about how the entrepreneurial spirit, as I called it, helped them at home with their kids with simple things. They helped their kids develop goals. They helped the kids develop the idea of self-reliance help the kids develop ways of guiding their life that help with their own decision making so they weren't always pulling at mommy and daddy on every decision. The kids began at the young ages of 11, 12 to begin to make rational, well-founded decisions on their own. Well, that's one of your big concerns, in fact. In fact, you say, I'm going to read it exactly, a certain fear drives me sometimes yes. these days. And that fear is that that's no longer happening. Now. I could tell you that fear always drives my day, so it really doesn't matter. But the truth is, is that we, without that ability to take on that sense, as you say on your, on your website, perseverance, persistence, that, and passion, then we as a society are actually losing out if our younger generation is not in that same mode in that same stream. You know, Barry, I, I think and you're right. I think that life goes in cycles. And one of my favorite cycles that I read about as we were approaching this millennium was what was happening in our country back around 1900. And who were the, the mockers? Who were the, 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 the visionaries? What were they doing? What were they thinking? And I believe that 
we need the same sort of thing now, still at the early stages of this millennium, as we every day we get lessons of the chaos we see in Washington, D.C., or emanating from Washington, and worldwide in a variety of ways, other countries, all kinds of peoples. It is a, a universal malaise, ignoring nobody. <laughs> and so, therefore, I say, there had to be guidance from those old days. And for me personally, I hark back to my grandfather, who I'd never got to know very well because he was gone at a fairly early age, a very early age for me. And I said to myself, I said, in the early 20th century, a person of color living in a small town in Alabama, working with institutional racism, was able to make a living by putting together a small business. And so I grew up with this notion that thinking that way would be the freedom card for people of whatever ethnicity or gender. Well, but your philosophy that stemmed from it, I want to read it exactly because I think it really sends it home. We were taught to believe, yes, there were certainly obstacles, but very few real barriers. That's the thing we, we can't, if, if anything that, as you said before we even started, you wanted people to know is, you wanted them to realize, sure, obstacles are going to be faced every day, but do they stop you? Do they bar you from doing what needs to be done? You've realized at, at a young age and, and live your life, no. Uh, yes, obstacles are simply meant to be walked over, jumped over, walked around, etc. When you come down to talking about barriers, we give ourselves the barriers. That's where the biggest barrier lies, is right in here someplace usually. Every barrier I've ever had only resisted in there. That is the amazing thing. People, it's very funny because you can, you can choose to look at something as, as a victim, Yes. Or you can choose to look at something as a hero. Yes. And as a hero, you're not, you're not going to escape the fears you have. You're not going to escape the obstacles. But a victim allows them to rule him. And the hero or heroine says, no way. I'm going to view that as an opportunity. That's another almost mantra throughout your speeches and your, your websites and what you do for the Making It Foundation is you, you want people to know that every obstacle they face is actually an opportunity. This show would not exist if I wasn't, I can't even use the word, if I wasn't dealt with in such a bad way yes. because this opportunity would never have come about. Yes. The opportunities are right there with something that bugs you usually. And of the thousand, well, actually over a thousand entrepreneurs that we featured on the television show Making It, I began to learn from the very beginning, story number one. And I've gone back recently to visit with my first story and my 20th story from the show. And I know what those people are doing now. I know how they're thinking like entrepreneurs endured. I know how it guided their lives. And in both cases, resulted in great fortune for them, which I'm happy to talk about. But the idea of entrepreneurs seeing an obstacle, Uber, the guy couldn't find something. Airbnb, the person, the founder couldn't find something. So they were people who saw that something didn't exist. They were frustrated enough. And when your frustration gets to be about that much higher than the fear, you will take action. And so they took an action step to begin to create something that wound up being, of course, part of our lives today. One of the actions that you believe to take is start talking to other people. Every single person that has done something is in the same boat that you're in. You now, and as I said, you you've mentored me many times. I, I one of the first people I call when I'm dealing with something, or you'll call me because you sense I'm dealing with something. But that is the key: is you've got so many people out there. You've got to open up to them. And that also is another thing you can do to get off the couch. Even if you can't yeah. think of what to do, do there's, that. There's a couple of things to do with the fear and the entrepreneurial way of thinking. And yes, other people. One of the things many entrepreneurs wrestle with is sharing their idea at home, 
or with others, friends, etc., because they, A, think it will be rejected, and sometimes they tell me, oh, I'm so afraid somebody might steal my idea. Well, that's not the idea. The whole situation is sharing your idea selectively with other people, and how would I set the hierarchy for that? First of all, I'd share the idea with somebody who's already been down the road and created their own business. That's number one. Number two, I want to hear from people who have their doubts about my idea because that helps give the idea shape and durability. So A, to share your idea with other people is ultimately important. And most importantly, once you're actually starting these days, you can have personal coach, you can go to some free events, seminars, etc. There's all kinds of podcasts and things that will help you think through your idea and that piece of giving you some strength of idea. Because if, for instance, at home, uh, your significant other, wife, kids, whatever the case may be, if they don't talk the shorthand or know the shorthand of entrepreneurs and so forth, then you, you can be dejected from the first step by saying, nobody understands what I want to do. You've got to reach outside. Well, you know, I, I used to love when people would say, you know, times now are so difficult. And I'd say, oh, do me a favor. Give me that day and date <laughs> and year when it wasn't. Because it's always that way. That's, That's part right. of the, the key. That it, you know, we're, you're faced with these obstacles all the time, as we talked about. Yes. You, you can't let that stop you. But your other element on that website is passion. Hmm. Do you really want it? Those are oh, your yeah. words. Do you really oh, yeah. want it? And what are you willing to do to achieve it? You know, uh, Way back when I was in my early 20s, uh, a friend of mine, business partner, and I had started uh, a submarine sandwich and pizza restaurant in another city back east. And we had a very, very smart landlord who rented us this space in the store. And he was a durable, older guy, wise in business ways and so forth. And he said something that sounded strange to me at the time, but it came to be one of the ultimate truths that I've learned and applies in the lives of all these entrepreneurs that we've interviewed. And that was, he said, young men, learn to love your problems because that's the only thing you're guaranteed to have every day. So therefore, in all of the difficulties that will come up in starting a business, you have to take a problem and turn it a few degrees left or right because therein you'll see the opportunity and the passion that you have is the only thing that will see you through the problems. So you better be darn sure you love what it is that you're doing because as the landlord said, the problems, that's the part you'll get every day. You say this in fact that by doing that, you're actually building, and here's where we take it now out of the entrepreneurial. Yeah. If you look at that as just a person you are going to find those problems. How you're going to view your problem is that key, going back to what you said originally. Are you going to view it as something I, I, that is going to stop you, or is it going to create that opportunity? Yes. And there you go. We have to work on our attitudes. I still work on my attitude on a regular basis uh, oh. by reading or thinking. And is or it by, I'm going to interrupt because is it not the hardest thing to really do, isn't it? We, we can talk this way, but I was telling some students the other moment, you know, I said, it's easier, it's easy to say this yeah. attitude. It's hard. Oh, absolutely. And you have to do it every day. People say, well, how about, uh, and they pointed out Mark Cuban to me recently. And I said, well, you weren't around when Mark Cuban was waking up every day, doubting everything, calling up his passion and having to reaffirm his thoughts every day. It's like brushing your teeth. You got to do it every day to work on this because attitude dictates your behavior and your behavior determines your results. And as you say, you have to go the extra mile. <laughs> and I, I want to quote you exactly because I, I just think this is precious. There are no traffic jams on the extra mile because that's the one road that people aren't traveling that much. I love that line. There are no traffic jams on the extra mile. Very true. Very, because if 20 people started with a business idea today, it would be in uh, a matter of weeks and months when there would be 
10 people surviving, putting their idea forward and still, still adhering to their idea and possessed of their passion and determination to make this thing happen. If you get down the road a couple of years or 18 months or thereabouts, there may be three of those people left because those three have gone the extra mile and seen what was a crowd at the beginning become a wide open road. You also have some warnings though. One of them is an entrepreneur, I guess this is how the analogy began, is like a gardener. He's planting yes. the seeds and doing things. But you say that they also have to be very careful not to water the weeds. <laughs> I thought that was a great line because sometimes when you're just spraying the water all over the place, you have to be careful. And again, holds true for not only entrepreneurs, but in life general, not to let the negative stuff all of a sudden grow and take hold of all the positive work that you've been doing. Absolutely. What, what happens is, and I go through it because I've started more than one business, and that is suddenly one day you wake up, you got your clear idea, the one that's very clear, right on the, that end nose, and then you say, well, look at that shiny object over there. That could be better than my idea because you're now looking at the shiny object. Or something has gone wrong. There's a failure because any one of those over a thousand entrepreneurs that I've interviewed, they had lots of failures. I mean, and how you come back from failure is the determinant of how successful it will all be. So there you are sometimes in a failure position and you're beginning to look around and examine your idea. You're unsure. You look at the shiny object or thereabouts. And those things to me constitute the weeds. You don't give it any water over there. This is your central idea and your passionate you know, thing. You put the water there. The shiny object gets no water. The failure gets no water because those are the weeds. That's the thing I think I always try to emphasize most to my viewers is none of this is ever a straight path. So you have to keep re-establishing your own inner voice Absolutely. to a certain extent. Tom Brady, quarterback, you know about him, I'm sure. I've heard about <laughs> him. In fact, I'm going to leave here $50 richer because of him. <laughs> Tom is a guy who renews his energy, and his favorite book is one that I've read, The Four Agreements by uh, Miguel Ruiz, because it's so fundamental as to how you think and how you're thinking determining the results that you get that Brady has read that book many times probably before each season, probably certainly before a Super Bowl game, because it's a reminder of the fundamentals, a reminder of what's necessary. And if you're being reminded of those things, it reinvigorates you about what you decided is your purpose, your direction, your goal, and your passion. An interesting fact that I heard uh, a few days ago from a friend is that here is, because you brought up Brady, Here's a man who should, by all rights, be the highest paid quarterback in all the land mm -hmm. because he is the winningest quarterback in all the land. And yet, from what I gathered, I, I want to—I may the number may be off by one or two, but he's about the twelfth lowest paid quarterback, believe it or not, because of his values. Mm -hmm. And he did not want to tip the cap on the NFL teams, he'd rather be a successful entrepreneurial football player yes. and have the team, the linemen, the running back, the ends that could support him. And he's willing to take less money in order for the greater good. Brady, I've never met the man. I've never been to one of his games. Of course, I've seen him play on television. And when I learned about him a few years ago, something about his values and about how he relies upon those sound values and, and refreshes them in his mind on a regular basis, I said, that is a visible secret of success. Well, and those values, part of them are enable to him surround himself with the right people. And that's another thing that you delve deeply into hiring. How do you make those decisions because surrounding yourself with the right people makes all the difference in the world because not only are you going to benefit by their experience mm -hmm. but again just the joy of work 
is important if you don't surround yourself. So hiring the right people, and as I say, having been hired by you for the first job ever as a producer, I happen to think you have excellent decision-making <laughs> powers. <laughs> and over the long arc, I agree with you. <laughs> hiring people is, uh, uh, I don't know if there's a school or to, to tell you how to hire people, it begins in here. You, you feel something in here when you meet the right person. I've been so fortunate to be hired by some people and given opportunities as a network executive and other things that I have been, had the good fortune to do. But in my own business, I've made some mistakes along the way. But the continuum, when you stand back, sit back and look at the people that you've hired and how they've grown and so forth and so on, it's to me, it's the human condition at its best. There's a woman, as I was driving here in traffic today, I thought, there's a woman that I hired way back in it, after I hired you in a, another situation, and she was in over her head when she started work for me and producing a television show. But I saw something in her, a warmth and enthusiasm, a brightness and so forth and so on. And though she was in over her head, she quickly became one of my most durable, reliable, and best employees, spent a decade working with me. Along the way, I remember she had a, a sort of a beat up old car when she started working for me. And then in a short period of time, she had a new convertible because she was succeeding in the job that I had given her. And at the end of our 10 years together, she went out and started her own business. A person who on resume basis, in the beginning of our working relationship together, would not have passed muster would not have gotten the attention of many people, but for some reason, attitude, enthusiasm, all those things that I value were showing. But that's because you shed that on others, Nelson. That is why you're here today, and I want to even use these words because this is what you taught me. These are your exact words. I tell prospective employees that mistakes are not a tragedy. But what they do after a mistake is critical. Yes. And that's, I can't send that home enough because people are so afraid of A, that failure, of that making a mistake. I say mistakes are the greatest things in the world. You cannot possibly move forward without <laughs> making them. I know because that's all I do is make <laughs> mistakes and correct them. I rarely get anything right the first time. Mistakes and failures are the best classroom in life because if you're paying attention, then you have now know something that you didn't know yesterday. And you're quite right about, there's a culture in running a successful business and we've all seen it. If, if, if we look at the government on one side as a very formal business, and then we look upon uh, a kid running a lemonade stand on the other side as the most informal business, there's many opportunities for mistakes. But the culture that I believe is so important to have in your house and your family and in your business is that when a mistake happens, look carefully for the lesson, correct it, move on, and never mention it again. Well, you know, I, 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 may I take it one step further sure. because I, I learned from you. So, and that fact, I love the story about how your employees did well because I learned not only that, but even if you're not gonna, I'm gonna this is gonna sound terrible. Yes. Sometimes make a mistake even on purpose. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why. Because nothing shows true character than how you respond to a mistake. And I've noticed, and I didn't do it on purpose, but I noticed when I've made a mistake, my response to that mistake put me in a better light than if I never made mm -hmm. the mistake. Absolutely. I mean, from uh, various points of view, and remember we're talking about entrepreneurial thinking that can be applied whether you're in cubicle 146 at General Motors or in your own home or in your own business. So when a mistake happens and you've taken that lesson, it gives you greater confidence. And with the people who look in on you, if you've got two employees or a thousand employees, they look at you and then say, Barry or Susie took it on the chin they didn't fall down, they didn't give up, and most of all, they didn't give up on me. Nelson, 
you have never given up on me and <laughs> our time is up. But you know, I've been able to benefit from you. Now I hope all my viewers do as well. Thank you, sir, for being a friend and a guest today. Oh, what a delight. I'm taking this wisdom and I'm right, started writing a book that'll come along uh -huh. sometime in the foreseeable future, I hope, so that it can be shared with many other people because this is a time in our country's life when I think that people need positive examples and the kind of role models that have a long trail behind them. And you've left a beautiful trail. Thank you, sir. And thank you all for joining us. Now, before Nelson leaves, I'd like to leave you with some more of his entrepreneurial wisdom that will apply to every aspect of your life. Too many people grow up without a clue regarding their true potential to live a life resembling their dreams. I'm Barry Kibrick. Between growing up without a clue and your true potential, that is where the dreams are, and that is what will lead you to a fulfilled life. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. My pleasure. Very wise words. <laughs> They're yours. <laughs> to connect with Barry, like him on Facebook and follow him on Twitter at Barry Kibrick. And to contact Barry directly, view past episodes of Between the Lines, and read his weekly blog. Visit us at barrykibrick.com. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Sam Ash Music, a proud sponsor of Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick. Sam Ash has been serving musicians since 1924. To unlock your inner musician, information is available at samash.com. Thank you.